Hello there. As you are aware, this channel's main focus has been timelines about video game genres, and there has been a specific interest toward the RTS, as it was and is still my favorite genre. But of course, there are other genres that have sparked my interest as well. In today's video, I wanted to change it up and talk about a specific video game series that I also enjoyed playing growing up, Heroes of Might and Magic. A lot of younger age gamers will not know much about this series, and what it brought for the strategy genre specifically turn-based during the mid-90s to early 2000s. I know what you're probably thinking now. The Heroes of Might and Magic series has games released in that name since 2015, which is not too long ago. I want to reiterate by name. I won't get into too much detail on why I have this perception on the later Heroes games, specifically after Heroes 4, but overall they don't have that Heroes of Might and Magic feel, and they're terrible. Today we will go through a timeline of the development from the first installment right up until Heroes 4 and some of the reasoning behind the abrupt downfall of the franchise. I know I mentioned that I'd be talking about the Heroes of Might and Magic series, but before I get into that, we need to take a peek at the game that inspired it all first. King's Bounty was released in 1990 for DOS, and it was developed and published by New World Computing, NWC. They at this point are widely known for publishing the role-playing dungeon crawlers that have had quite a bit of success so far, called Might and Magic. King's Bounty was NWC's way of testing the waters into the strategy genre, which was quickly growing around this time. It is a turn-based strategy with all the basic blueprints of the Heroes game. In the beginning, you select a hero from four different classes that differ in skill allocation. This hero is controlled by you to move around the map that is swarmed with units who block your path towards treasures and that must be fought. Sometimes these units are willing to join your army. When a battle does take place, it shifts to a separate screen from the adventure map. Your troops that have similar units are stacked together and begin on the left side of the map, and the enemy units on the right. Both of you must obliterate each other's armies by strategically moving your units, or if they have range, attack from a distance. You can also have your hero cast spells that can always tip the scale of the battle to your side. There is a castle occupied by a king whom you serve, where you can replenish your units each time you go back to visit at the cost of gold. Gold is generated weekly from the king's allowance to you. You may also collect gold from successful battles and treasure chests. These chests give a choice between gold or increasing your leadership skill. The hero does have skills such as leadership that dictates the number of troops you can have in your group to battle and the spell power that affects the damage of the spell. While you move your army, days and eventually weeks pass by. Creatures back at the home castle replenish for recruitment. You can also encounter creature dens where you can purchase units to join your team. Creature abilities that we see in heroes are surprisingly present in King's Bounty. Some examples include the sprites being capable of flying across the battle map, trolls regenerating at the end of each turn, and the peasants being as useless as ever. It is really astonishing and also amazing that all these aspects mentioned are still found in the Heroes games years later. I had no idea that the Heroes series had been influenced by another game, but it does make sense after all, since they were developed by the same team. Just so you're aware, there's a lot more to this game. I just went over some of the gameplay aspects that are still seen on the Heroes series today. Though King's Bounty did not succeed in the market, underselling to what NWC had hoped for, and because of this, they would not have a direct sequel to this game. Instead, they would piggyback on the success of their Might and Magic series and create a spin-off series later called Heroes of Might and Magic. It would focus on a very similar and influenced gameplay to King's Bounty, but set in the vast and established Might and Magic universe. Heroes of Might and Magic, a strategic quest, was released in 1995 for DOS, published and developed by NWC once again. This time around, NWC needed a better game plan on how to properly execute a game that matched the level of quality for the time it was released compared to the other games. King's Bounty lacked in visuals, graphics, sound, music, and replayability. And right off the bat, you can see the art style was smoother, detailed, and less blocky in Strategic Quest. You can easily make out what the unit is actually supposed to be, whereas in King's Bounty you could not tell if that was a peasant or a savage barbarian wearing a mask. Sound effects are now present during action on the battle. When attacking or being attacked, you can hear the unit's sword clinging and the receiving unit's grunting in pain. Music now has a presence, with calm ambience during the adventure mode, and nice jungle-like drum music good to set the mood up for a battle. Visuals and music are going to be one of the main focal points of development throughout this timeline of heroes. 
as every succeeding iteration seems to improve on the last one. Simple, but it is one of many of the reasons why I enjoy and look forward to playing the Heroes games. Let's get into the long list of gameplay aspects Heroes 1 has improved on or added. You can choose among the four castles that have their own unique buildings, creatures, and heroes. Barbarian and Knight heroes are more focused on the defensive and attacking skills, whereas the Sorceress and Warlocks focus on the knowledge and spell power. You can recruit up to 8 heroes who each carry their own army of 5 similar unit stacks. Enemies are now active players that have a different flag color from you and potentially have a different castle type. Their goal is the same as yours, to eliminate your team. There are still enemies that are found throughout the adventure map and can be encountered when you click your hero to move towards them. The hero is able to only walk a certain amount depending on the yellow meter for a day. Once that is used up for all your heroes and the rest of your daily tasks are complete, you must click on the hourglass icon to pass a day. On the new day, the travel meter is reset and building a new structure in the castle is allowed once again. This changes from the live movement in King's Bounty to more of a turn base during the adventure screen, making it more reasonable for you to take your time and think in which direction you should proceed or allowing the enemy to have their turn. Recruitment at the castle has changed where you are in charge of deciding which buildings to construct as only one may be built per day. There are six unit tiers and as you go up in the tiers the stronger the unit in battle and also the tighter the population growth. Note once again that the hero only has five unit stack slots so you will not be able to carry all six unit tiers in one army. Most common buildings are the creature dens where units can be recruited but there are other buildings that may help your hero like the mages guild. The Mage's Guild, depending on its level, can allow your visiting hero at the castle to learn strong spells. Resources and gold are both used for building and recruitment, so it is important to find them throughout the adventure map and also taking over mines. These mines provide daily income of the specific resource, sometimes gold, so long as they are under your control. The enemy player may also have their hero take over the mine, so it may become a back and forth between you and the enemy. Interactions with building on the adventure map may not only occur for recruitment tents, but also places such as a statue that can improve your troops luck and morale. These two variables indirectly affect the battle. Higher and lower morales can play a role on whether your stack of troops can have another turn or lose a turn during a round. Luck may only have a neutral or positive impact that can double the damage of an attack. Now getting into the battle screen, a lot has improved most noticeably the interface. For easy clicking to move your unit to the furthest space slot they may travel. Also to easily access the hero screen where spells can be casted once per turn or if the battle is not going your way, surrendering or retreating to the nearest castle to avoid losing your hero forever. Why is it important to keep your hero? There is a leveling system for the hero through experience gained from successful battles or treasure chests. A gain level improves one of the hero's four skills. A hero may also siege enemy castles to take control of them, further providing units and income. The defending army has the advantage of the walls and an automatic turn that strikes a random opposing unit each turn. The sieging army does have the catapult to slowly break down the walls for the units to enter and attack. Losing control of all your castles will result in a 7 day ultimatum of finding a new castle or your team is eliminated from the game. This rule also applies to the enemy teams as well. Strategic Quest was released in 1996 as a Windows version, better music and sound quality. Did NWC's new series introductory game succeed in what King's Bounty missed on? Indeed, sales were a success for the first installment selling over 100,000 units a few months after release. And not to mention, it was even more of a success critically nominated and winning multiple awards. Specifically, Computer Gaming World Strategy Game of the Year, which it tied with the classic Command and Conquer. Already you can see the beginning of the detailed, colorful and natural visuals the Hero series has brought. And this first of the series will prepare you for the long but enjoyable campaigns that have many encounters keeping your eyes glued to the computer screen. Fast forwarding to 1996, Heroes 2 The Succession Wars is released and it improves on the first game in just about every way including gameplay, story, graphics and content. But it needs to be noted that Heroes 2 was developed by NWC and now published by 3DO who has purchased the right to all of NWC's assets and has kept them as a subsidiary to 3DO. Quickly going off topic, but 3DO was founded by the founder of the now widely known Electronic Arts EA 
Trip Hawkins, who had decided to step down as CEO from EA and move towards building his own video game console. It was called the 3DO Interactive Multiplayer and first hit the market in 1993 at an alarmingly expensive price of $699, more than double the prices of the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. With poor sales and very little interest from third parties to invest, 3DO's rights to their future next generation console, M2, were sold off and any gains were used to purchase NWC and become its parent company. This information will be important when we conclude this series of Heroes later in the video, as it will explain why I choose to talk about Heroes up until the fourth installment. Getting back on track, the main campaign is more fleshed out, with the player being able to choose a good path with Roland or an evil one with Archibald, each their own unique scenarios. Campaigns now include pre-rendered CGI cinematics and full dialogue during the briefings before a campaign scenario. Though the cinematics are static, they went well with the narration. If you are faithful and we win this war, I will grant you an earldom. Continuing on visuals, during gameplay the animations are more refined with more frames, making them look a lot less choppy when the units move on the battlefield. Also, the unit animations look less character-like and goofy. The artwork of the dragons in Heroes 1 looks ridiculous and it seems that it took inspiration from the kids' TV show Dragon Tales. Of course we have to talk about the music next, because it goes hand in hand with the visuals. And it did not disappoint, as it was a step up once again. I think the improvement comes more from the choice. Now in Heroes 2 it seems that it is much more suited for the fantasy theme, with the usage of the harpsichord as the main instrument for the adventure theme. During the castle garrison of the hero, the tone of the music matched the castle type, and it also included opera to add more intensity and mood. No joke, there would be times where I wanted to play Heroes 2 just because of the soothing music. Interactions on the adventure map have also increased, adding in more mines to control, areas to visit for loot, spells to learn, more artifacts, creature encounters and many more. You can see this easily when looking at the much more filled and lively map. Castle type and hero class are now the same and have now increased to a total of 6, half of which have sided with Roland, Knight, Sorceress and Wizard, while the other three, Necromancer, Warlock and Barbarian, are against them and pledge their allegiance to Archibald. This does not really limit you to the only three castles when you decide to choose either path on the main campaign, as you can recruit and benefit from any of the six castles once you conquer them. The castle garrisoning screen has not changed a whole lot other than the UI arrangement, and the fact that there are more buildings other than creature dens that can benefit your kingdom's income, population growth, and siege defenses. There are still six tiers of units within a castle, but now certain tiers have an upgraded form that you can obtain when purchasing an upgrade of their creature den. This upgrade allows for statistical improvements and may grant the unit a new ability. Moving on to some improvements on the hero. The four skills are now primary and essentially have the same effect previously, but now there are secondary skills where a hero may learn a new one or improve an already learned skill when leveled up. Primary skills are still increased by one point and it is usually one that closely relates to their class. Secondary skills have three levels of expertise that better at each time, basic, advanced, and expert. They may learn up to eight out of the 14 secondary skills available. But keep in mind, not all classes may learn a certain secondary skill, as they are reserved for specific classes. Example, necromancy is reserved for the necromancer and the warlock, who has a rare chance to learn it. The heroes now have a mana meter for spells used during the adventure mode and battlefield. This meter level is determined by the number of knowledge skill points your hero has acquired. Each spell now has a mana cost and it is determined by the level of the spell, with higher levels consuming more mana. Lastly, the battlefield has had some tweaks of its own, where more importantly it now has a grid which will show the exact location the troop can travel to and help with unit spacing. The battlefield is much larger, giving more space for units to maneuver. Unlike in Strategic Quest, where at the beginning of the match, if your troop had an obstacle spawn directly in front of them and an allied troop on top, they would inefficiently have to skip their turn until the allied unit moved. The spell animation when casted are much better visually and make more sense. The lightning bolt spell previously resembled flame ignition, whereas now in Heroes 2 it actually shows lightning striking. Although the gameplay aspects were not changed drastically, they were improved upon enough that made a lot of them staples to the Heroes of Might and Magic series. 
Also, don't forget that Strategic Quest and Succession Wars were only released a year apart, hence the reason behind the vast similarities. You can judge when a game has had some level of success, when it's followed up with a release of an expansion. In the case of Heroes 2, it was followed up with the price of loyalty a year later, which included four new campaigns, new scenario maps, and new artifacts. Both of these were available in the Heroes 2 Gold Edition released in 1998. The sales were doing particularly well according to their new owners of the Heroes series and the now parent company of NWC 3DO. At this point, the Heroes games have put out a big enough name to now recognize them as their own style of gameplay that required a lot of commitment from the lengths of the scenarios, perseverance to overcome the difficulty of the AI, and the sheer joy of the overall visually and audibly beautiful games. <laughs> Would the next Heroes game stick to these pillars and keep the successful trend going? In 1999, three years after the initial release of Heroes 2, the third installment of the Heroes and Might and Magic series was released. Heroes 3 does not directly continue the story after Archibald's defeat by his own brother Roland. I sentence you to be turned to stone and locked in the West Tower. Who has now become the rightful successor to the Iron Fist crown, but rather Roland's disappearance, to which his queen, Catherine Griffinhart, must protect her now assassinated father's realm from the evil invading forces of Nia, led by warlocks and overlords, and the demon like creatures of Cregan. Arathia must not fall to its enemies. While this chaos ensues, she learns of her father's revival as a lich by the same necromancers who assassinated him. No choice, Queen Catherine was set out to kill him in order to stop him from ruling over Arathia as a cold-blooded, power-hungry totalitarian. They will not disturb your eternal slumber ever again. As per usual, there are castle types that support Queen Catherine. Castle, Rampart, and Tower. And those who are against her rule, Inferno, Dungeon, and Necropolis. The Barbarians are still neutral, but now two more castles have joined the neutral alignment, Fortress and Conflex for the later expansion, making it a total of nine castles that each have seven unit tiers, which the hero can now entice all in an army, and each tier has an upgrade with no exceptions. This is a great new feature that improves the overall game content, but it does come with some side effects, being that it takes a long time to fully upgrade your controlled castles. This reason being the cost, which forces you to search for the necessary resources and gold, or wait each week for the mines to provide for you. And to remind you that only one building can be built per day, per castle. We are now able to centrally recruit the creatures available in their dwellings once a fort is built in the castle. It takes you to a screen that has each of the unit tiers along with their stats and how many available to recruit. This is a small but useful convenience from having to search for each of their dwellings, which you can easily forget. On the castle garrison screen, you also are able to easily see other castles you control on the interface and are able to switch over them like in Heroes 2. Units on similar stacks can now be separated into another stack. This is a very useful tactic when you face an army with a lot of unit types because separating some of the larger quantity of stacks can allow for an even distribution of attacks as each stack receives a turn during the round. The battle screen has not changed a whole lot aside from having the field of view zoomed out, thus allowing more units on the battlefield. Let's talk about the hero who now has a specialty that can make a certain troop stronger when used in their army, or improve a skill even further than the three levels of expertise. The hero screen now has the artifacts placed in the correct body part of a human body diagram and cannot have more than one artifact placed in the same slot, just like in RPGs. Certain artifacts that don't belong on a body part are placed in the four slot. Any artifacts obtained after the slot is taken will remain within the hero's inventory as inactive. It can be switched out if you choose to. Heroes carry a catapult during a siege as usual, but they also can carry other war machines such as Ballista that basically behaves as a unit, but attacks random enemies by launching an arrow. It can be further upgraded to strike twice and commanded on who to attack with the ballistic skill. The medical tent offers healing to a hero's unit per battle round. It may also be upgraded by the first aid skill which increases the health restored. And finally the ammo cart which provides unlimited shots for your ranged units in a battle. Total number of artifacts have increased to 122, further improving them both statistically and circumstantially. They are now categorized by what they benefit, spells, during combat, resource, adventures such as movement, and scout radius. And lastly, primary, where one of the four primary skill points are increased. And to take it a step further, they are also tiered by rarity. The Shadow of Death expansion also introduced combination artifacts, that once a full set of artifacts were found, they combined into one very powerful artifact. 
During your time on the adventure map, the one thing that stood out the most as new was the idea of a subterranean gate that brought you to an underworld. It was a separate map that also needed to be explored with its own interactions of monsters, buildings, and even castles. But keep in mind that it also provided another path for the AI to use to ambush your castles. As you may have noticed, Heroes 3 did not invent the wheel on gameplay aspects for the series as a whole but I can tell you that it refined a lot of the ones we saw earlier, and the main one being the visuals, where it had its own tone of realistic and less cartoonish to its predecessors. This is likely from using a 3D model to pre-render the graphics. The tone of the colors used were more of a dark palette, and it had its own thing going. It differed from the bright and shiny tone we admired in Heroes 1 and 2, but it was successful in further capturing our attention. The other best thing to come out of this game that should be emphasized greatly is the content. More castles, more units, more artifacts, more campaigns, bigger maps with more interactions. The fans seem to agree on this also, with sales exceeding the 1.5 million mark for all three installments months after Heroes 3's release, which played the biggest part in that achievement. Critically, it was approved across all gaming websites, most agreeing that it was the best of the series yet, and it's not even close. It was a finalist in a stacked competition for the Best Strategy Game of the Year award at the third Interactive Achievement Awards that was won by a timeless classic, Age of Empires 2. I will say this, and it will probably have a lot of you fight me for it, but I believe it's the best turn-based strategy game. Say what you want in the comments. This is simply for its addictive nature, lots to do and worry about at the same time that can make you spend days before completing a campaign. Another great example of don't fix what ain't broke. The Heroes 1 and 2 games were great, and the Heroes 3 game was even better. It was a shock to see the turn-based strategy was still relevant at this point, as many thought by now it would have died out in comparison to other real-time genres. And with 3D games booming around this time, it was hard to see a Heroes game without the beautifully detailed 2D sprites. Heroes 4 rumors were spreading and fans were interested to see if the series would create its first 3D game. But this wasn't their only question. Would this fourth game live up to its predecessor? It would indeed be a hefty task. Heroes of Might and Magic 4 was brought to the gaming world in 2002, developed and published by the same teams of NWC and 3DO respectively. It takes place in a new world called Axioth, where Enroth has subdued a reckoning caused by events that take place in a Heroes 3 spin-off called Heroes Chronicles. Chronicles uses the same game engine, but has toned down the difficulty and is more story-driven, to hopefully attract a different audience. Back to Heroes 4. Refugees of Enroth led to this world using a portal, and now they must rebuild their kingdoms from scratch. And to all things comes a beginning. There are six campaigns revolving around a different character which have no direct relation or sequential order to be played, and it takes place in different parts of the new world. I wasn't sure how I felt about having campaigns that don't follow a chronological time frame, but I truly enjoyed each of the six campaigns and I thought they were well written with some tense moments that it almost felt like I was reading out of a novel. Now before I get into the gameplay aspects, it should be mentioned that Heroes 4 has had the most radical changes of the series. Starting off with the visuals where both the adventure screen and battle screen were in isometric 3D, meaning that they were actually 2D but were drawn to make it look like they were 3D. They were still pre-rendered sprites and backgrounds, the same as Heroes 3. But don't get me wrong, they still look beautiful and smoother on the edges, despite becoming a little less detailed than the previous game in my opinion. Heading over to the other aspect we look forward in a Heroes game, the music was once again sensational and a step up and Paul Romero has done a phenomenal job as composer for all four Heroes games so far. Each of the castles once again had their own tone, where the Chaos Faction had a tense ritual music and the nature was more of a calming hymn. The opera was brought back to the town music, and it was now included in the music during the adventure mode, which gave the game more of a fantasy feel. Overall, most noticeable change is the hero, who now acts as a unit in the battle, on top of keeping the same duties previously of spellcasting and retreating when necessary. They are now able to attack, and are a target to be attacked by enemy units on the battlefield. The levels they gain strictly improve their own damage and health points in this iteration. Four primary skill system has now been replaced with a primary skill that has three interconnected secondary skills and a learning tree. Expertise of skills are now five, adding master and grandmaster level. Some skills may improve unit stats such as offense and defense skill, which improve all units carried by the hero's attack and defense during battle. As the hero racks up levels and certain skills, they can change the classes and each class has its own ability to benefit the hero's team. 
Moving on to the battle screen, where a fair amount has changed, starting with a view that has rotated diagonally to better show the isometric 3D. Unit formations in battle are now two rows where the front can have up to four stacks of usually stronger melee units, and the back which is preferably reserved for the weaker ranged and spellcasting units. The one retaliation now occurs simultaneously unless the unit or hero has an ability that changes it otherwise. Retaliation can now occur between two ranged units. Morale and luck have both changed in how they benefit your troops when granted. Morale is now given at the start of each round to indicate that they will start before non-granted troops. Multiple troops that have been granted will prioritize the faster unit to go first in the round. Luck now dictates how much less or more damage a troop will take. Positive luck can reduce damage by a third, and negative luck can increase damage by up to half. Killed heroes in a match will no longer allow you to retreat or surrender, and if you lose a battle, the hero is put into the nearest enemy castle prison. Captured heroes can be freed by your other heroes that take over the castle. Any killed heroes in your party will be revived when the hero visits the castle or a sanctuary. Sieges have changed where there is no longer a catapult and instead your melee units must break down the drawbridge to invade. The defending castle units no longer have automatic turrets and instead have three platforms where preferably range units can be placed for extra defense and it removes any range penalties from the castle walls. Invading range units cannot attack units hidden to a certain distance behind the castle walls, and if they can there is an additional wall penalty. Armies can be dispatched with a non-hero where the unit with the most walking distance on the map will be shown as the leader. These heroless armies may attack, collect resources, and join other armies, but they cannot invade a castle nor take over mines. A slight disappointment is that the castle types have shrunk down to six, where each have their own heroes and now unique spell type. Continuing the trend of not so great surprises, each castle now has only four tier unit levels, with no upgrades. But from level 2 to 4 you have an option to pick from two creatures of the same tier. This potentially can make the same castle types unique. But I think the goal of this shorter tier list was to create room in your army for a hero or two to join, and to add other unit types along the way. It actually made more sense as I played further because I still had an issue of not having enough room, similarly in previous Heroes games. The variety of structures to build has gone down as well, but one of the new buildings to note is the Caravan, which is available in all castle types. It allows you to transport your units to another friendly castle at a cost and a certain amount of days depending on the distance among the two but it is still shorter than traveling conventionally through the adventure map, though you must ensure the path is not blocked by enemies on the adventure map. Castle fortifications no longer impact population growth, that has now changed from weekly to daily, which I find was a relief and took away the pain of wasting days just to wait for a new week to reinforce your army. When in the castle screen there is a button that will efficiently choose as many troops that you can afford to purchase. This saves you from going to the castle structure or each dwelling and manually clicking multiple times to recruit, and with limited gold sometimes you are not sure which units to get the best bang for your buck. There were two expansions released, The Gathering Storm in 2002 and Winds of War in 2003. They were mostly content additions of campaign units, a few new hero types, and The Gathering Storm did implement a multiplayer that was lacking initially. The campaigns felt like they were completed half assed as script was not nearly as well written as the original game, and it really killed the mood when some of the new hero names that sounded silly. Spasmaticus. There wasn't really anything new that we could look forward to. Overall sales for Heroes 4 units I could not find anywhere. This usually implies that it did not do so well. Though critically, the initial game had mostly good to great reviews of scores that were in the high 7s to high 8 ranges out of 10. Most of the resentment from longtime Heroes players is the fact that this was the first iteration where content actually dwindled down from its predecessor. Heroes of Mind Magic 3 had a plethora of things to do, units to find and upgrade, interactions within a campaign, and two fully completed official expansions along with fan-made ones to go with a spin-off series. And this is why it is a timeless classic, but I don't think it's fair to expect that the next game of the series should follow exactly in its footsteps. The goal of releasing a new game is to change it up, and I think a lot of the innovations in Heroes 4 were undermined. Yes we can go on about the lack of overall content, but I also think that simplifying the game was beneficial too. Was it not a pain to have to pay for gold and resources for 7 tiered buildings only to have to upgrade them with using even more resources? I do think that there is a lot that was lacking in Heroes 4 aside from the content, such as the graphics that were not exactly appealing to the eye in comparison to the other video games for its time, and the fact that it was not 3D also made gamers instantly look away. But, but I believe there has to be some exception for Heroes 4 for what was happening during its creation. As I already mentioned, when 3DO acquired NWC it was not exactly in a good financial position, 
as it merely used the sale of its unsuccessful console name that gave them the ability to acquire NWC. And of course, the success of Heroes 3 did help out slightly, but once a company has multiple years where they are not making a profit and resort to using credit instead, this is going to take a toll on the company as a whole. It came back to haunt them during the creation of Heroes 4, where 3DO made some major layoffs in its entire company, including its subsidiary, NWC, which cut half of their staff. So imagine working in a team where half the members were laid off with no payment package, in the middle of the Heroes 4 creation, all while there are whispers and chatter of 3DO potentially filing for bankruptcy. Without doubt this is going to affect the morale of the team, which in turn affects their work, and you got it, the quality of the game. Once Heroes 4 Winds of War was completed, 3DO filed for bankruptcy and sold its rights to the Heroes series to Ubisoft. From this point on, on top of changing the publisher, the developing team was no longer the same, the composer and designer were scrapped for new ones, and the whole Heroes of Might and Magic feel was diminished after having four games with this consistency. I felt with Heroes 5, I was disappointed that the very pillars of a Heroes game, the music, the beautiful visuals, decent story was absent. I did not even bother to play longer than a few hours. To be fair and to give the rest of the series a chance, I will eventually play Heroes 5 and beyond with an open mind to see if it still holds. Or maybe I'm wrong. You tell me. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you didn't, let me know why. It would really support the channel. Thank you and later.